We are going to continue going through the book of Ezra. And I, I told everyone last week, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure this chapter is interesting for you. And if you've read ahead at all, you will see it's a whole lot of names. Okay, now we're not going to go read the chapter before. I don't want to, uh, I wouldn't want to ask anybody to do anything I wouldn't want to do. But I am going to read uh, most of this chapter. We have to go through it because uh, we're trying to go, you know, it's my goal to eventually preach through every chapter of the Bible. And so uh, obviously we've got to cover these things. But what we're going to talk about today, though, is why genealogies are so important. Because have you ever wondered why the creation story, the creation story, how the universe came into existence, you got 31 verses in Genesis chapter 1, yet this chapter gets 70, where we're just reading a bunch of names. And obviously, God's priorities are not our priorities. I would have rather given 70 verses to the creation story and 31 to all the names. But there's, we have many chapters. It's pretty much just all genealogies. It's all names. But these things mattered, and they mattered for a reason. And so we're going to talk about that today. Uh, as we, uh, but we're going to go through here. Uh, because these names, too, they do mean something. There are some notable names in here. And as we talked about last week, the, the key to understanding Ezra, you have to understand the history and what is going on during this time. So uh, let's start reading verse 1. It says, Now these are the children of the province which came up out of the captivity of those which had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away unto Babylon. And came again unto Jerusalem and Judah, every one unto his city. Verse 2. So first off, remember, it was 70 years earlier when Nebuchadnezzar uh, carried all these families away. And it gives, and it's going to give the number of them. Uh, but there, were, there were many. But what we're going to see here in this chapter too, something also that's important to understand is one of the reasons given these names and the numbers of the people is it's showing how once again that even though Israel was in captivity and bondage, God blessed them and they multiplied. While they're in captivity, remember what happened when they were in Egypt? They went down 70 souls, but then they came out this great multitude 400 years later, where here it's still a pretty good amount that comes out, not as much because it was only 70 years, but it just shows how God was blessing them as a people. And so in verse 2, we're going to see some notable names. It says, which came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Reliah, Mordecai, Bilshant, Mispar, Bigvi, Rehum, Bana, the number of the men of the people of Israel. So there's some notable names in here. First off, Zerubbabel. Okay? Zerubbabel. He is an important character because he is actually the son, if you remember, in the, if you look in the genealogies, in Matthew 1 and verse 11, it says, And Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Salathiel, and Salathiel begat Zerubbabel. Okay? So right there we see that Zerubbabel... He is this, uh, he's in that line of the kings, but they don't have a king during this time. But he would be somebody who would rightfully be the king. So here, I want to show you this because, uh, and we're going to get into the importance of this. But let me see if I can find the one where it's a little closer. up. This is a messianic genealogy going all the way from Adam to Jesus. And so uh, I want to point out right here. So we have King David. And from King David, this is on... Mary side on the mother there's a lot more names this is a genealogy that's in Luke but you'll notice there is a Shealtiel which is uh, Salathiel and Zerubbabel now I don't understand this and nor do I even know if it's right or not but this goes from David to Nathan and then there's a lot more names but you've got two names in there that would be about the right time for this Zerubbabel but the thing is too we're also going to notice, and so sometimes there was adoptions and things. I think this one is strictly, um, you know, genetic, as the way Luke did it. But here, you'll notice, too, there is a shield, teal, and Zerubbabel in the line from Solomon, too. Because this is David, but then it goes to Solomon. And this is the genealogy that we see in Matthew. 
This is the one, kind of the legal one, the kingly line, showing that Jesus Christ, too, was the rightful king of Israel, basically, is what we're seeing here. And so you'll see, though, that Zerubbabel, he is an important character, because either way, this for sure is the Zerubbabel that we're reading about in Ezra. That other one, some people think it is. I don't know how to prove that, nor do I know how to disprove it. But he's this guy that we're looking at is where the Messiah is going to come from. Now, we know that from looking back, but they didn't know that for sure then that he would be that guy. So just an interesting thing to keep in mind. But Zerubbabel, he was a, he was a major leader when the temple was destroyed. You know what? The Bible doesn't do this, but historically... The original temple is known as, what, Solomon's temple. But then, when they rebuilt the temple that we'll read about, it, uh, the one who led that was Zerubbabel. And so often it's referred to as Zerubbabel's temple. And then later, Herod refurbished it and made it a lot greater. And so when you're at the time of Christ, it's the same temple, just improved. And sometimes they'll call that Herod's temple, historically. Which, if they build another temple it will probably get named after somebody too. And guess who that guy would be? Uh, we would call him the Beast or the Antichrist. And so that's what I think is going to, well, I think that's going to play out. But Zerubbabel, very notable character. Another individual is mentioned there is Jeshua. He is also Joshua, uh, and he is the high priest. And he's mentioned a lot. He's talked about in Zechariah. So he's a character we see a lot. He was a, a spiritual leader during that time. He was the high priest, and he, uh, we see a lot of good things about him in the Bible. We also see Nehemiah mentioned here, too. This is the same Nehemiah that we see in the book of Nehemiah. And one thing that's very confusing that I'm still trying to wrap my mind around uh, as I'm going through these is understanding the timeline of things. Because the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah and probably even Esther, they all kind of intersect with each other. So it is, it's one of those things where... You kind of think of Ezra and then later Nehemiah comes along. But it's like, no, their times intersected with each other. And so it, everything's not completely chronological, so it can get a little confusing. I'm still trying to figure all that out. But they are, they're kind of interwoven. And so Mordecai, not 100% sure. This is the one from Esther, but it seems like a pretty safe bet. It's naming all these notable characters that he would probably be one of them. And who knows, too? Esther could have been, uh, and I, I still don't fully understand where she was in the timeline, but I'm wondering if that event and that story in the Bible is one of the things that influenced Cyrus to allow the Jews to go back and rebuild their temple, which, as we talked about last week, was a huge, huge deal. And so it's going to go through showing us the families, the numbers of people who came to, back to Jerusalem. and then. I, but I want us to point out some things. So you know what? I'm, I'm going to trust that you all are going to read Ezra chapter 2. All right, we're, we're not going to go through all these names, but basically it goes on the children of Parash, 2,172. 2, the children of Shephatiah, 372. So basically what we're seeing here is showing the names of the families and the leaders and then how many there were. Showing the number of people that were going to be going back to Jerusalem. And so just uh, jump to verse 64. All right, I want to point out some very important things here. And we're going, to, we're going to see why this is in the Bible. And why this is so important. These things cannot be ignored. But it says the whole congregation together was 40 and 2,303 score. Besides their servants and their maids of whom there were 7,337, and there were among them 200 singing men and singing women. Their horses were 736, their mules 245, their camels 435, their asses 6,720, and some of the chief of the fathers, when they came to the house of the Lord, which is at Jerusalem, offered freely for the house of God to set it up in his place. They gave after their ability unto the treasure of the work three score and one thousand drams of gold and five thousand pound of silver and one hundred priest garments. So the priests and the Levites and some of the people and singers and the porters and the Nethanims dwelt in their cities and all Israel in their cities. So one of the things, again, this is amazing that they would let 
what was it, 40 some thousand people, not counting the servants, all these animals, these are all people that are under their tribute. So do you realize how much wealth and how much power they're losing in letting them go back to their land? I mean, they're losing a ton. But you know what? Again, God put it in the king's heart. And that's just another thing to remember, too. I mean, whatever God used to change the king's heart, God used that to change the king's heart. And if God could get a king like that to do something that was so against his own interest, you know, earthly speaking, you know what? It can kind of give us hope no matter who our leaders are in our world that we're living in today. Because God's gotten some pretty bad guys who are very powerful to do some pretty good things for the world. So um, just, you know, at the end of the day, let's not despair at who's, you know, in the governor's mansion, in the White House, or whatever. You know, God's on the throne, important thing. But anyway, but in this passage, what it's basically showing us is that even though not Israel, but Judah, even though Judah was in captivity, God did not only preserve them, but he blessed them in multiplying them. And this was, this was a great exodus, kind of like in Moses' day. It just, you know, smaller scale. And instead of a king fighting against it, you have a king supporting it. And now who would you rather be? Pharaoh, whose kingdom was destroyed as a result of fighting against God, or Cyrus, I believe, you know, God blessed and preserved his kingdom during the, his time because of what he did. And you know what? They did the same thing the Egyptians did too. Remember when the children of Israel left Egypt, how it says they spoiled the Egyptians? The Egyptians wanted to get them out of there because they were so afraid of them. In this story, they voluntarily, we saw that in chapter 1, they voluntarily are giving gifts to them and blessing them. And again, that was a good thing. Them blessing the Jews was a good thing for them because these people that they are blessing, that they are sending back to their land, are the people that the Messiah is going to come from. And Jesus Christ, Abraham's seed, all the world has been blessed through him. And so, uh, important thing, but uh, look at verse 59. I want to point out something else very important that people who like to lift up races often ignore. This is an important verse right here. Again, when you're reading through a uh, genealogy like this, it's real easy to just read through, get your scripture reading done. But hey, there's some valuable nuggets in there sometimes. And I have used this to shut many people up when they are talking about foolishness based on someone's genealogy. And it says in verse 59, because remember, they've been in captivity for 70 years. Them maintaining certain history, genealogies, all that kind of stuff was a miraculous thing. This was something that the northern kingdom, we will probably talk about this in a later week uh, in, in much more detail, but the northern kingdom, they had been taken captive much earlier. And because of their time that they spent in these other nations, they became way more intermixed with everyone. A lot more time had passed, and these people, when they did come back to the land, they were so mixed, there was so much confusion, there was so much history lost, while it was accepted that these people were of Israel and that they were Jews, understand they weren't able to prove it. And as a result of that, they were kind of like a lower class of Jews, you can kind of say. So by the, and, and this is, it's hard to get this just from reading the scriptures because we have 400 years that pass in between Malachi and the time of Christ. But something that we see and, you know, that history backs up and then something we observe when we get to the New Testament is we do have the Jews who were basically like the purebred Jews, the ones who had maintained their identity, who had a record of their lineage. They had done all these things while you had these other people that it was kind of accepted that they were Jews. They practiced in certain things, but they weren't really able to prove things. And so as a result of that, uh, they they didn't get treated the best, and so you did. You had your pure, pure breeds, and then you had your I don't know what, what would they call them for lack of a better term. But you know, but people like the Samaritans, for example, who were very intermixed. And we'll we'll say more about that and give more proof on that. But look at verse fifty nine. It says, "And these were they which went up from Telmela, Telharsha, Cherub, 
Adan and Ammer, but they could not show their father's house and their seed whether they were of Israel. So we have a group of people who claimed to be of Israel. They claimed to be of these tribes, but they weren't able to prove it. Now, what did they do when someone claimed to be Jewish and yet they weren't able to prove it? Well, it says the children of Delea, children of Tobiah, the children of Kodah, 650 and 2, and the children of the priests, the children of Habaiah, the children of Kaz, the children of Barzillai, which took a wife of the daughters of Barzillai the Gileadite and was called after their name. These sought their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore, were they as polluted put from the priesthood. And the Tershatha said unto them that they should not eat the most holy things till there stood up a priest with Urim and Thummim. Okay? So notice that right there, that these people who couldn't prove their lineage, they were considered polluted and put from the priesthood. So they claim to be Levites. And here's the thing. They may very well have been Levites. But notice what they had said. You know what? You are not going to be able to participate in these things until a priest stands up with Urim and Thummim. Now, what does that mean? I don't know for sure. Okay. Now, I, I, I really don't. Now, I'll tell you what some of the theories are out there that make sense, especially when you look at the context of this. But I, I've read all kinds of things about what Urim and Thummim was. Supposedly, it was this... Uh, they, it was like they, they would have these portions of scripture that was like behind their ephod or their, uh, I forgot what it was called, that they wore on their chest that had the stones of the 12 tribes of Israel. I'm messing up the microphone here. But um, supposedly, if there was a situation where they didn't know, or they needed an answer for something. You know, for example, these people can't prove their lineage. We need to know, are they legit or not? That God, some believe that God would do something with this Urim and Thummim to reveal the truth to them. So basically, until it was revealed by God, they weren't going to be able to participate. Now, the Bible never tells us if it was ever revealed or not. I don't, I don't even know for sure that that's what that is. Uh, maybe Pastor Boyle knows all about that, and he could straighten us out on that later. But I, I don't know for sure what that is. But here's what I do know. When these people couldn't prove their genealogy, they had no claim to the priesthood. Because that priesthood, you were supposed to be in the family of Levi in order to be a part of that. And so uh, they were being sticklers to that. And rightfully so, because genealogies mattered during this time. So uh, just as kind of a side note, you'll notice in Nehemiah 7, you don't have to turn there, but these exact verses that we just read are repeated or referred to in, in Nehemiah just to kind of show you, too, how some of these stories intersect. And it's basically because he's just referring to, um, you know, those that sought their register, uh, just showing the people who are helping and all that. So we do, we see some of these exact things, these genealogies all repeated in Nehemiah. I'm not going to take any time uh, showing what that's all about. But here's what I do want to talk about. Why were the genealogies so important? Because, again, 70-some verses... Most people just want to read through it, and you don't think anything of it. But I'm telling you, these genealogies were there for a reason, because they were legal proof. And understand, I mean, what, what do we call the Old Testament? The law, okay? The law is one of the things it's called. And so under, it, it, it's not enough that God is just saying certain things. No, he's got to preserve it in his word, right? Because anybody can come along and say, well, God said Anybody can do that. And God warned about priests who come along and say God said when God didn't say that. And so God did something to help us. God gave us his word, his written word. These things were written down. And so these promises that God made, especially messianic promises, he made sure they were written down and that they were preserved in his word. Because this law, this is the authority. Israel was supposed to follow the law of God. They were supposed to do exactly what it said to do. And even in the New Testament, when we get to the New Testament, everything that the apostles teach us is based on the law. It's based on the Old Testament because the word of God is what it's all about. And so these genealogies, that are, especially these ones that are being recorded in the scriptures, they were legal proof that God had fulfilled his promise 
of the Messiah. Because God cannot go against his word. Psalm 138 verse 2 says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. So God's word, it's very important. And God in his word in Genesis 3.15 said, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Anybody know who that's prophesying about? That's Jesus. That is how salvation is going to come. So at the fall of man, at the fall of man, this is where I want to start kind of sharing some of these genealogies with you. At the, at the fall of man, immediately God promises a Messiah. God promises the seed of a woman that's going to bruise the head of Satan. This is important. This is this. Not only is this Jesus, the son of God. Okay. We understand it's going to be that, but basically let's put ourselves in the minds of Adam and Eve back then. God is promising a man that's going to come. If you're Adam and Eve, where's that man going to come from? It's going to be one of their descendants. So they, they understand that, that, but there is, there's going to be one that's going to come. That's going to basically undo what Adam had done. That's what God promised there. Okay? Now, if they believed that, guess who they believed on? They believed on Jesus Christ because Jesus is the one that would do that. So when we start getting into the genealogies, we have Adam, the first man, and then we have his line. And you remember, first, the first two children they had was Cain and Abel. Okay? Now, you all know the story of Cain and Abel. Who was the chosen one? Does anybody know? Who did God choose between Cain and Abel? Abel. Abel was the original chosen person. Okay? Now, why? Why did God choose Abel over Cain? Because God liked his genes better? No. Faith. Right? He offered it. And so, God chose Abel, but Cain killed Abel. As a result of Cain killing Abel, God, there, there was a curse that's on Cain and on his line. And so, what we end up seeing in the Bible, we have... Cain, and then it gives his genealogy. But then the Bible records the birth of Seth. And what did Eve say? God hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. Seth is going to be where the Messiah comes from, not from Cain. Okay? Cain, he's kind of a cursed race. But what we end up seeing as we go through these lineage here, when we get to Enoch, the seventh from Adam, it was around, and when we get to uh, Lamech on Cain's line, the se also the seventh from Adam, that's when we see the lines come together. That's when the sons of God, the line of Seth, and the daughters of men are coming together, and basically the world gets corrupted and filled with violence. But it's, it's this line that we're watching. And, and uh, to Seth was begat Enos, and then is when men begin to call on the Lord. And I believe that's, and so we have this line, but it got so messed up by the time we get to Noah. Look what the Bible says about Noah. It says in Noah, uh, Genesis 6, 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. All these lines are getting corrupted by Cain. Only Noah is righteous in his generations. And so again, Looks like these genealogies matter, even during this time. But and Noah, he's not corrupted by this. You say, well, what, do we need to worry about this stuff now? No, because guess what? Cain's line got wiped out in the flood, didn't they? The whole world got wiped out except for Noah, who was righteous in his generations, and his family. He had his wife, he had his three sons, and their wives. And so after the flood, the line of Cain is gone. Ab and then, you all know the story. We end up, you know, going, you know, after Noah, we got Shem, Arfax, Ad. Somewhere in here, we have the Tower of Babel. And then we've got a whole bunch of people named, and then we get to Abraham. Abraham is the next one that God chooses. And understand, God is not just looking for a race of people that he likes best. God is looking for a people that the Messiah is going to come from.
That's what he's looking for. That's what's being preserved. And so in Genesis 12, 1, it says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, into a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So now let me ask you a question. Did everyone who descend from, descended from Seth, even though he was the appointed seed, you could say, or the one appointed the line, where the line's going to come from, did they all go to heaven? No, absolutely not. Okay, when we get to Noah, okay, I mean, Noah is the builder of the ark. Noah starts the world over again. We all descend from Noah. Did everyone who descend from Noah go to heaven? No, obviously not. And so then when we get to Abraham, Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Now, Abraham is the chosen one. Abraham is the one who in, 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 his, in him, all the nations of the world are going to be blessed. Are all of Abraham's descendants chosen? No. Did they all go to heaven? No. Abraham had two sons. He had Ishmael and Isaac. Okay? Isaac was the one that God chose, not Ishmael. Now, did everyone that descended from Isaac, were they all chosen? Did they all go to heaven? Why not? Is Because Isaac, he had two sons too, didn't he? Jacob and Esau. So is Esau Abraham's seed? Is Esau Abraham's descendant? Of course he is. But he wasn't chosen, was he? You know, God had chosen Jacob. Okay, so then when we get to Jacob, all right, Jacob had 12 sons. Did all of Jacob's descendants, God changed Jacob's name to Israel. Did all of Israel's descendants go to heaven? No, absolutely not. Okay, now, while they were the people of God, they did not all go to heaven and understand when we get to when we get when we get here, again, it's not about this new race of people. Okay, it's not about this new group, it's not about this new nation. What made Israel important is it's narrowing down as the world is growing and expanding where the seed is going to come from. This is all about the seed, this is all about the Messiah. And everybody today, they're still obsessed with you know races and lines and genealogies and all that. There's no need for that. The promise is about the seed. We're, we're waiting for the Messiah is what we're waiting for. So when we get here, we got Jacob, but then we have Judah. Now there were 12 sons. Judah was not the firstborn, but in Genesis 49, 9, it says, Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey, my son. Thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couches a lion as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come and unto him should the gathering of the people be. So you know what we have here? We have a messianic promise that comes from the line of Judah. Okay? Now, did everyone descend from Judah? Were they all saved? Did they all go to heaven? Of course not. Okay, we all know. So we have Judah, Perez, Hezron, Ram, Minadab, Nyashin, Salman, Boaz. We know him from the story of Ruth. Obed, Jesse, and then David. David is another one that is specifically mentioned that the Messiah is going to come from. It says in Isaiah 11, 1, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. That's, there's Jesse right there. Again, it's getting narrowed down as time goes on, as it gets closer to the Messiah. And a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Verse 10 and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. So this, this uh, root of Jesse, this, this branch that's going to come from that line is one that all the Gentiles are going to look to. The Gentiles are going to seek after this one. What's going on? This is that promise of the Messiah. So why are the Jew Gentiles included in there? I thought it was all about the Jews during this time. Hey, God, this, this promise of a Messiah, it wasn't just to one group of people. It was really to the descendants of him. And we do. We all come from Adam too, which is why we're all sinners. That's one thing we all have in common. This, this Messiah that's going to come is not just a promise 
to the line that he comes from. It's a promise to the whole world. And this promise to the whole world, when God told Abraham, in thee shall all the nations of the world be blessed, it's because this Messiah who is going to come is going to come for all the world. And so it's amazing how we have taken our focus, one, off the Messiah, and off of the world that he came to save, and we've made everything about the ethnic line that he came from. That even though, I mean, folks, we, we don't have one... We don't have one of these individuals so far that has a preserved, righteous, you know, seed going forward. We don't see that. Okay. Now we're going to get to one, but we haven't seen that yet. So Revelation twenty two sixteen, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you of the things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. And you say, well, why does he... Be, be the offspring of David. Because David is where the Messiah was promised was going to come from. He's showing, I'm the one that fulfilled the scriptures. God promised that he was going to do these things through the line of David. And so that, again, right here is where we have that line of David. And, and what some will say, and I, I agree, this is the biological line that Jesus came from. And then down here is the, the legal line that Jesus came from. Just showing that he meets all requirements, legally, physically, the whole nine yards. And so now, when we get to all these people, we don't... Now, Solomon, did everybody that descend from Solomon, were they all saved? Were they all chosen? Obviously not, okay? He had some pretty bad sons. Rehoboam wasn't that great of a guy. Abijah was a really bad guy. Asa did pretty good, but Asa didn't end too well. Jehoshaphat was pretty good, but Jehoshaphat kind of ended bad too. He messed up. You know, Joram, Ahaziah, he was really bad. Joash was really, he started out good, went really bad. Amaziah, Uzziah, I mean, Uzziah died a leper. You know, he went into the temple when he wasn't supposed to, got lifted up with pride, even though he was a good king most of the time. Jotham, he was a good guy. You know, Ahaz, Jeconiah, they, that's when they went captive. Well, I skipped a bunch, but, you know, Hezekiah, he was pretty good, but didn't think very much about the next generation. So, I mean, all these people, they have major problems. Zerubbabel, we don't really see anything negative about him, but then these people, we know nothing about them. We don't really know anything about them until we get to Joseph, okay? Now, and we all understand that Joseph was only the legal father of Jesus. He was like his stepfather because Jesus was the son of God. And so, let me ask you, when we get to Jesus Christ, I know that's, I don't like doing pictures of Jesus, but I stole this off the internet, all right, but do all of his, are all of his descendants chosen? Are all of his descendants righteous? Are all of his descendants preserved? A absolutely. We are in Christ. Now, obviously, no one physically descends from Jesus Christ. But we spiritually are born again through faith in Jesus Christ. And we are all preserved. We are all sealed. And I say all that to ask you this question. What line did he come from? He came from the line of Israel. He came from Israel. Jesus Christ is where the promises to Israel are fulfilled. Not everyone that descends from Jacob. I mean, we can, everyone would agree with that, wouldn't we? That, I mean, not everyone that descends from Abraham, but what do we have people doing today? Well, there's a group over there that they, they have this, you know, these genetics, therefore they're special and they're chosen. Why? It's never been that way before. It's never been that way before where everyone from any of those groups that where there was a promise were automatically sealed and preserved. They always had to be a faith for it to matter, for it to count. And then here's the other thing too. What if those people can't prove they're from the line of Abraham? And guess what? They can't. So what should we do? Well, first off, for us as Christians, it just doesn't matter, does it? Because in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's bond nor free. We are told in the New Testament not to give heed to endless genealogies and all that kind of stuff. Now, does that mean we can't pay attention to the genealogies of the Old Testament? Well, of course we can pay attention to those because those aren't endless. They end, don't they? Where do they, when, where do they end? At Jesus. 
You know why? Because that's where the fulfillment is. That's where the fulfillment of God's promises to Israel come from. They come through Jesus Christ. And that is why he is the chosen one. And those who are in Christ are the chosen ones. They are Abraham's seed. They are where the fulfillment of the promises. You say, but you guys, you know, you don't physically descend from Abraham. Well, I don't really know where I physically descend from going back too many generations. But here's what I, here's what I do know. I am saved. I've been born again. I'm in Christ. I'm connected to Christ. That's all that matters. It doesn't matter if you descend. You know, you might be convinced that you descend from Cain. All right, that's impossible. But either way, you, you know, it doesn't matter where you descend from. If you are in Christ, that is what matters. Are you saved? That is what matters. And so the Bible goes into it great detail showing all these lines. To, so God, it was God's way of showing us I'm fulfilling the promise. I'm, for, I'm fulfilling these messianic promises and all the world will be blessed by this. And so what we're seeing in Ezra is in spite of the biggest judgment that they've had up to this point as a nation, their city being destroyed, them going into captivity for 70 years, these people still maintain their identity. They still had their genealogy. They still had these records and God brought them back to the land and they were able to prove it. And we see a group in here that couldn't prove it. This wasn't just a group of people identifying as Jews. No, these were people that could prove who they said they were, who they said they were, and that mattered because it mattered where the Messiah was going to come from. God told Israel many, many of these things so they would know where to look. They would know who to look for, and they did. Jesus Christ fulfilled all of those things, and so. Whenever you're reading those genealogies, it's part of the Bible for a reason. Don't just skip over it. I know those names are hard, but, you know, pay attention. They're there for a reason. And, and notice that little detail, that little nugget you can throw in people's face. Hey, look what happened to the people who couldn't prove their lineage. They were considered polluted. That's, that's good ammo to use for people who are still trying to lift up races above others today. Uh, that's a, if they can't prove it, then it doesn't matter. And even if they did prove it, if somebody came along and was like, Brother Tommy, I've got records. I actually talked to a Mormon guy here in town one time that said that he could prove his lineage going all the way back to Abraham. That's what he told me. Now, I didn't believe him, but, you know, I was like, well, you know, that's interesting. You know, just you got to play along with crazy sometimes. But even if, even if he proves that he is a direct descendant from, from Abraham, I don't see any promises, any prophecies for people that descend from that, you know, outside of Christ. Here's the question. Are you in Christ? And this guy was far from saved. <laughs> so who cares? You know, there, there's, there's no good prophecies coming for you. So anyway, hopefully that, that helps you understand why these things are in the Bible and why they matter. And so with that, let's close the word of prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this uh, chapter and the things we can learn from it. I pray help us to uh, not get lazy with these things, but help us take the time to read them and figure out why they're there. And we thank you for preserving these things for us and for uh, blessing us uh, with the Messiah, Jesus Christ, in your name. We